And we're live. Hello, 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 everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this wonderful webinar here today. My name is Mike Supervici. I'm the head of acceleration at Desal Group. Desal Group is an organization that runs um, several training programs. Uh, we are right now probably the most known for our VC Lab Accelerator, which is the leading accelerator for venture capitalists worldwide. We have launched over 400 venture capital firms to date. I think just last year alone, we launched 209. And we've done that all over the world. You know, 66% of the alumni uh, from the program are um, outside the United States. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very robust program that gets people to a first closing. So when we talk about like launching a firm, these are firms that have actually reached a first closing. So we have quite a lot of experience in, in doing so. And Interestingly enough, this year, um, quite a lot of folks uh, came to us. Um, uh, the GPs that we were helping with the program help were came to us and say, hey, a lot of LPs that want to learn more about investing in this asset class. Then we had LPs come to us. It's like, hey, new and emerging managers are, you know, uh, really diff different with regards to sort of how we do this, this stuff. So we launched an initiative called LP Institute. Um, and, uh, you know, which is essentially an accelerator to help new uh, or more established LPs learn how to invest in new and emerging managers. And uh, the admissions for that uh, will uh, close this weekend. Uh, and it's going really, really well. Happy to discuss that more uh, in the future. Uh, if this is your first time joining us for a webinar like this, a um, couple of things. First, say hello in the, in the chat. I see that there's quite a lot of people are, are starting to say hello and, and all that. That's great. Um, and before I also introduce Marco here as our panelist, um, just know that there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can always add, ask questions for myself and for Marco so that you know we can go ahead and make these highly, highly interactive. These, these are webinars that we do for you. We do them every single week because we want to sort of bring out this knowledge to the rest of the industry so that, uh, you know, we can democratize it for everybody. And so, you know, if you have questions, put them in, uh, upload them, and we're happy to sort of answer your questions. Um, what's going to happen here today is that first, I'm going to obviously introduce Marco here. Uh, but, but after I do that, him and I are going to go into sort of a discussion. The topic of today is more like diligence around, you know, uh, emerging managers and things like that. So we're going to have a very fruitful discussion around that. But as always, if you have questions, we really want to do, we're doing this for you. So make sure you put those questions into the Q&A there moving forward. All right. So without further ado, let me introduce Marco Hara. Marco, Marco is probably one of the most uh, uh, experienced uh, investors in uh, emerging managers. Uh, you know, prior to joining us at Desal Group for our Desal Capital uh, initiative, you know, he has funded hundreds of, uh, you know, uh, emerging managers as, as, as part of the, uh, you know, Finnish kind of program there. Uh, and I'll let Marco sort of talk about that. Uh, and just uh, a wonderful source of knowledge. I love doing these uh, webinars with Marco, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it as well. So Marco, can you also please introduce yourself for the audience here? Yes, of course. As Mike said, my name is Marco Hera, and I started the finance investment business 1986, which I think is 38 years ago. A long time. I was 20, 22, almost 22. I was 21. Um, I co-founded a couple of companies. I started with uh, options and futures and hedge funds and stuff like that. Uh, then went to uh, found a couple of companies more and got some exits, got myself into family office business in the late 90s. And then for about 23 years ago, uh, I was a GP investing in, in uh, pre-seed and seed companies. We had a fund, it was a listed company. Uh, around 2006, I was asked to join a pension fund uh, to be uh, responsible for their fund investment direct investment and co-investment program. Uh, we invest in all types of funds from uh, first-time managers to established managers, venture capital, uh, private credit, private debt, infrastructure, uh, uh, private equity, LBOs, uh, you name it. Uh, I have have been involved in a couple of hundreds um, different fund investments. 
maybe 60 to 70 co-investments and uh, around the same amount in direct investments. Uh, I have cross-cycle experience. Uh, I was a GB before the uh, before the dot com bubble, and also uh, responsible for fund investment before the great financial crisis, and and now this. So, <laughs> this is what I've been doing for the past almost forty years. Incredible! Thank you so much for joining us today, and I'm super looking forward to this conversation. You know, Marco, one of the things that we see a lot is that there seems to be a little bit of confusion in the market, right? Like right now, this term emerging manager is hot, right? But there's a there's a difference, at least from a LP's perspective, between a new man, what's considered a new manager, what's considered mm -hmm. an emerging manager, and what's sort of considered an, an established manager. From your perspective as an LP, how do you sort of how do you differentiate? How do you what's your sort of definition for these for these types of uh, investors? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, first of all, there is something which I call for a first time manager, which means that it really is the first time uh, they are founding a company, they become uh, GPs. They could also be first time teams, which means that it would be the first time they act as a team. But bo both first time managers and teams are in a group of emerging managers as well. Because when you raise the second and third fund, they are still considered being emerging managers. And, and if they're able to get the fourth one, then they would not be emerging managers anymore. Then they would be established managers, which means that uh, if they raise the fourth fund, they would have been in the business for at least uh, eight to 10 years or something like that. So yeah. the journey from a uh, first-time manager to a uh, established manager takes quite a few years. And and how what you know what are the sort of like the different risks that you sort of assess? I mean, you know, this is obviously a webinar around diligence, but like you maybe on a higher level before we go really deep into diligence, what's sort of like the risks that you sort of assess as a new at a new manager versus an emerging manager versus an established manager? Uh, well. At, at least for a institutional investors, the thing that I was most interested in was to make sure that if we invest in the first time managers, we would like them to be able to raise at least a couple of more funds, you know. It's 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 very difficult if you're just investing in one of one of the funds, the first fund, which means that we are gonna thinking about the going concern principles that we try to make sure that it's going to be a firm that's going to be there for years. Because if I invest in one of these funds, the life cycle of the fund in venture capital is anything between 10 to 15 years. Nowadays, it could be even more. So I need to be assured that the company is still there because of the very long-term investment. So that's the, the first criteria. Uh, obviously, we uh, we would like to have the survival ratio to be as high as possible because, as we know, not all first-time managers make the second fund. So that is very important to understand for for the LP's perspective. What's what's the risk there? Like, if the if the first-time manager doesn't get to their second fund. Uh, I would say that, uh, as we know, the, the fund raising cycle used to be a bit longer in the past. It was like three to four years. Then it got to maybe 18 to 20 months, you know, which is quite short time. And it really meant that the first time managers were raising their second fund once they had invested like 60 or 70 percent of the fund. And, and because of the time frame was very short that we didn't know exactly how the portfolio would be in the future. Uh, it's, it's difficult because the DPIs normally don't come in before the fourth or fifth year. Uh, yeah. So it was a lot of uncertainty, but it really means that we're, what we do have there is the team and, and if they're being able to invest as they promised, you know, uh, on theses, following the strategy, so it's it's a lot of a lot of about the team 
uh, and a little bit less about the fund uh, or about the uh, track record, which is still quite uncertain. Uh, sometimes what can happen is that if you start your fund and it's going to be a bad vintage, which means that a lot of these funds are not going to perform well, it really means that the risk is higher for them not being able to uh, raise the second, third and fourth fund. And it really means that the fund selection, it's, it is extremely important. Those funds we invested, uh, these first time managers and emerging managers, the survival ratio was almost 100%, which is quite unusual. Very Anything unusual. over 80 is pretty good, you know. So it really meant that we spent a lot of time with our due diligence, understanding uh, these these people. What are their motivations? You know, are they in this business for the long term, which they should be? I mean, speaking of uh, due diligence, you know, you talked about like kind of understanding like their motivations and things like that. Can you talk a little bit of kind of what your diligence process is like, at least for emerging managers on a high level? Uh, and maybe give us some context around sort of how do you assess their motivations? Yes, absolutely. That's one of the most important parts of it. Um, I would say that you have these all, all kinds of checklists for the due diligence work. But we need to understand that a checklist is just a checklist. And the most important thing is to know how to use it. What are the, you know, the most important things there? But there is one thing thing that I, I would like to emphasize before we enter the due diligence stage, as we do, for example, at Desar Capital, uh, there is, of course, the, uh, the, the uh, sourcing stage, you know. We have to understand what is the pipeline. And in our case, it would be the VC Lab cohorts, you know. And, and we have all, all these managers that we expect uh, to raise capital, maybe, and close their fund during the next three to 12 months, you know, that is the big funnel, the, the sourcing stage. Then we enter the screening stage and we do some pretty high level screening analysis about these uh, fund managers and investment opportunities. And we write a short memorandum on that. And some of these funds get into the due diligence stage. It really means that there has been things going on there several months maybe before we start to conduct the due diligence. Uh, I, I normally would like to start with the manager and team overview. And it really means that there is some quantitative and qualitative, qualitative assessment there. And, and sometimes I, I make reference checks already there to understand the, uh, the motivations and, uh, and the, the, um, why they are doing it, you know. The, the first thing a manager should ask himself is why I'm going to do it. And do I actually want to do it? And if I want to do it, what it means. And it's extremely important for them and to, to me to understand that they really understand that this is a potential 10 to 15 year relationship. It is very long term, you know. After that, we get into the strategy. Do they have a, a clear strategy, which is focused, uh, well thought out? Uh, it should be, uh, it should align with the, uh, the best practices, basically. The industry standard, because there are these industry standards. Uh, then I would go to track record if there is any. Sometimes they don't have that investment track record, you know. Some might have some angel track record. Some might have some track record as members of, of uh, some other VC companies. But if we are talking with founders and operators, they might not have it. Uh, then we go to terms, you know, they should be fair terms, transparent, uh, straightforward terms. Then it's operational due diligence. It's all about reputational, ethical standards and cultural values. They, they, this is very important. And then in, in some cases, if I don't know these people at all, which might ha happen, we, we might understand if there is some regulatory history with them. 
and uh, but that's that's something uh, that, that doesn't happen very often. Then it's the legal due diligence, as you know, and then we get into re reference checks again. Reference checks could be former colleagues, some LPs they might have in the fund already, some other people they know, some founders maybe, and some of the GPs. So that's basically what happens before the case gets to the first IC meeting. Uh, you know, it's really interesting. You you know, you mentioned you've been you've been doing this for a very very long time. I'm just super curious. You know, how has how has your process uh, improved over the years, or if if you learned anything over the years that you sort of adapted uh, as you've become more and more experienced with this due diligence process? Yeah, there is. This is a good question, and it's a great relief for myself that something has happened during these years. And I would say that it's more intuition nowadays that, than it used to be in the past. And uh, if you think about the intuition, what it, it is, it's like, you know, it's basically a sense of knowing without knowing how one knows. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, you know. And, and it's like, it's basically that if you have been there and if you have seen it and done it, it gets a little bit easier. And uh, it's about, you know, combining different kind of insights from multiple sources. And uh, it requires a basically a, a some kind of leap of thinking, which is based on limited information, because mm -hmm. we don't have that information about first time managers and emerging managers, uh, in particular, when it comes to track record, you have to rely a little bit more about your your gut feeling or intuition and that is something that has happened with me uh, and it really means that you have to use that intuition when you are talking with these managers trying to evaluate them as as people and investors and their values and standards it's very important yeah, especially the values and standards part, right? Especially yeah. these days, it's a it's a very critical component that I think often gets overlooked as you kind of go through this like very rigorous, like very data driven diligence process. Yeah, the problem is that if there is no data, as we know, it's it's garbage in, garbage out. You know, there is it's difficult to make an analysis of something that doesn't exist. Right, and then again, everybody has been there, you know. All of the Hall of Famers in this industry have been first-time managers. There is that point for everybody, and in, it would be—it's our job to try to find out who these people are. And I'm quite convinced that we have already invested in some of these future Hall of Famers. You know, which yeah, is, which and, is and nice. it's tough, and it's tough, right? Because uh, in, in a, a lot of people say, "Well, I." I I was an angel for X amount of years. I mean, we've seen people that have done hundreds of angels deals. I've been a syndicate lead for years. I've got track record. I've got track record. But at this, at this stage, right? It's you know, it's very different because you're actually managing a firm, right? You're you're managing yeah. people's money for the next 15 years. It's a whole different thing. So yeah. there's only a little bit that you can actually draw from their previous experience, right? To figure out they can actually manage money for 15 years. Absolutely. And it's also about portfolio construction. Yeah, true. People don't think about portfolio construction. And as, as you mentioned, there are different types of investments. Like what I did in the past, sometimes I was a co-investor with a big fund and they made the due diligence, they made the term seed. And I just had to make a decision how much money we could invest in that. In some cases, I was the only investor investing in that, in that particular company. Sometimes we were a lead investor mm -hmm. and it's, there are different kind of, kinds of uh, situations. And, and uh, uh, you know, that, that's one of the reasons why the past track record is very difficult to understand. Even if you come from an uh, uh, established VC firm, because we didn't, sometimes we didn't know what type of role did you have there. Uh, if you were a deal captain, you have a certain role. If you were trying to just, you know, gather some information about 
the company, it was a different role. But as a GP, you, you kind of have to do it all. And it's, it's a big leap. It's a big leap and it takes time. And some may not like that. That's the other risk too, by the way. You know, some, you know, if you're if you've been an active investor at a very, let's call it famous firm, you spend 90% of your time just looking at in deals and investing the capital. Whereas when you start your own business, your own firm, you're spending like 60% of your time fundraising and all yeah. back office stuff, right? That's yeah. a very different ratio that some people might not be comfortable with. Yeah, it, it is true. And uh, I just spoke with one LP yesterday about. There is one word which I don't like about venture capital industry. I kind of hate it when people are telling me that it's sexy. It's not sexy. It's it's like digging a ditch, you know. It's hard yeah. work. It's hard work. Yeah, and especially for new and emerging managers. <laughs> yeah, it is hard work. It's, it, especially for them, uh, it, it gets maybe easier or different you know conditions are never perfect the challenges are different you know right even the, even the big guys have their challenges you know totally yeah everyone we're doing this for you so if you have questions for myself or for marco um, there's a q a button at the bottom of your screen i see there's a couple questions that have been added already please add questions there so that uh, we can prioritize them. There's also an, uh, a kind of like a thumbs up button that allows us to sort of look at them and like upvote them. Uh, and I'd love to sort of get to, to your to your questions um, as well. Really quick before I get to uh, Brandon's question in the, in the chat though, Marco, you know, you mentioned at the beginning when you're doing your introduction, you've done quite a lot of like direct investments. You've done quite a lot of obviously fund investments. And so for the folks that are sort of like learning how to kind of go in to invest in funds, but have experience in doing direct investments, how would you say the the process of evaluating a fund is different than say doing a direct investment in like a company? Yes, it is very different. And my, my background basically was that I had been a founder and co-founder with a couple of exits and I even had acquired a company. And then uh, went into the uh, family office and GP business, which means that we, we made a lot of direct investments. And even with that background, I had been there for 20 years before I basically became an LP. Uh, it helped me a lot. I have to say that it, it makes it easier to become an LP if you have that kind of background. Definitely. But it, it took me a couple of years before I understood about portfolio construction, you know, and why we are doing it. And also, we had to invest in different asset classes from private credit and private debt to, to first time managers in venture capital, which is a, a totally uh, different ball game, you know. But uh, I don't really want to go into details about the due diligence or the investment processes, what are the big, you know, the uh, differences when you're investing in, in single companies or funds. But I would like to say that uh, if you have that background, you've been doing direct investments or, or stuff like that, it's, it's gonna help you. But I'm not sure how much helpful you would find to have an LP background going to make direct investments. It really doesn't work that way. <coughs> yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. It, it is so, but there, there are so many differences that it would take half an hour to answer that question. But uh, um, it helps if you understand what it is to invest in single company and manage that company. You kind of start to respect the GPs a little bit more for because that's, it's not, you know, days of wine and roses there. Yeah, yeah, and and they and they're not making a lot of money, and it's like a lot of work, and it's it's pretty hard. Yeah, to it, it is, and you know, I remember when we got some exits. If you have a portfolio like thirty five companies at the same time, and you got a good exit, you you had a, you had a good time for one day, and the next day you were trying to figure out what to do with the other companies which were not doing that well. It's it's basically that kind of, you know, <laughs> I don't know what, what, what I should call it, but uh, that's how it goes. 
Uh, Brandon's asking, do you find that first time funds generally have outsized returns? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's my personal experience. Uh, that's what happened with us, you know, basically. I've, I've, all, I've thought about that a lot, and there could be several reasons for it. One thing is that they, uh, they, they tend to be smaller funds, you know, like sub 10 million or even 5 million, and they invest, uh, and they should invest in pre-seed and seed. They write smaller checks. Uh, they get, get in early. That's one of the reasons. And the other thing is that these managers... They, they take it dead seriously because they kind of have to make it. You know, they, they, really, they work hard with the companies, portfolio companies. And once the fund size gets bigger, you can't do it even if you wanted to. And then you, you start to invest in A bonds and Bs and Cs, which means that the multiples are not there. A um, couple of good examples. There was one particular manager, I think we invested around 2012. It was a relatively small fund. I, I think it was around 10 million. And, and the net multiple for that first fund was uh, about 12, which is exceptionally good. You know, they made a lot of money. They had one or two unicorns there. The second fund they raised soon after was about 50 million. And they still were able to make nice return. The net multiple was something between 4.5, maybe close to five. And the third one was 150. And they still managed to make a relatively nice return, but it was something like a little bit over three, three X. Same team, same guys doing different kind of things, you know. The only thing that happened that they moved from the grassroots level writing small checks to pre-seed companies, writing checks in the in the A and B rounds. It's it's different competitive landscape. Well, it's also just different incentives too. You know, when you have a five or $10 million fund, you're basically optimized for the carry as, yeah. as your main compensation. When you get into the 50 to 100 range, you're now optimized for the fees as your main form of compensation. Mike, I was trying to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> but you said it. <laughs> Fair because I, I still like the guys. They made a lot of money to us, you know, but now they... They have the management fee there as well, a, a larger organization. And the, if you have a big organization, you kind of have to have to have the cash flow coming in. Uh, uh, you know, there's a, a question for, for, from Sh uh, Sh Sh Shilipi uh, or Shilpi, um, how, you know, thoughts on the investment committee, you know, uh, for a fund, any sort of advice or best practices on how to, how to build one that's sort of productive uh, for, uh, for these firms? Yes, I have both good and bad experiences about it. There is one thing, it should be relatively small. There shouldn't be too many members in the IC. Uh, the best one I was, I think we were only uh, three or four people in the IC. And they all were uh, experienced investors. Uh, and they understood the asset class pretty well that sometimes you fail and sometimes you don't. And they, the, that that's that is important that they it's relatively small, and they they should be able to make uh, quick decisions, relatively quick decisions. They, they I, I like consensus or consensus minus one. You know, both both are fine if you have the good people in the IC. Uh, and there is one thing which they shouldn't should not do. It is that if somebody, if if you if we make a a bad bad investment, there shouldn't be any. Um, how would I put it? Uh, we, we should accept it, and don't go back into it. They 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 should understand that this is a asset class where people make mistakes. You know. Um, go for. It. Sorry, you were going to say something. Yeah, I, 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 there is one word in, in German, which is besser wisser. I don't know if you have that in, in, in the States, but it's a person who knows everything exactly how it is after it has happened. So there is no room for that in a good IC. They just have to keep their mouth shut. Or, or you just don't have an IC. 
right? Like, yeah. especially if you're a new fund, a lot of people I see that yeah. make this mistake. You just don't do an IC. No, I mean, no. It just doesn't make sense. It slows you down. You can't make a deal fast enough. Absolutely. If you are a small manager, you don't need an IC. You don't, you don't need it. It, it's, uh, it's always a little bit, takes a little bit longer time. And if you have an IC, you, it should be a good one. Right. You know, th there is a risk that it, it's, uh, it's getting slower. Um, uh, interesting question from, from Ashwin. Um, in, any thoughts on how to approach sizing your investments as an LP? Any sort of advice there? Uh, do you mean that? Like the uh, check sizes and stuff like that. As an LP, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it depends, of course, on on the fund size, you know. But basically, the rule of thumb, which I, uh, which we use, that you you don't want to go over twenty percent of the fund size. Mm. You know, if it's a ten million dollar fund, you you shouldn't invest more than two million. That's the that's the maximum, and you probably would like to keep it under 10% or at 10%. There are several reasons for that, you know. It's also good for the for the manager to have a diverse uh, uh, LP base there because um, as a GP, you have to learn how to manage your LP base. It's very important because sometimes LPs come and go and you can't really uh, rely on them 100%. And there should be different types of LPs because they behave differently during different market cycles, uh, depending on the fund size, you know, you should have the high net worth individuals, in particular, if it's a smaller fund, family offices, and then, then maybe fund the funds if you can get one, um, endowments, uh, and then, uh, then if you have a bigger fund, then pension funds and so on. But it's in everybody's best interest to have a that type of LP base and don't, you shouldn't have a dominant LPs there. Because yeah. in, in the worst case, they start to manage your fund and you don't want to see that. Makes sense. Uh, and it also, the for, same thing for the LP too, right? Like that also introduces risk for the rest of the LPs. Absolutely. The yeah, absolutely. And you, you might see all types of side letters there and so on, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is a bad thing. Yeah, side letters are no good. Yeah. Um, you know, Al Alex has, has a very interesting question, and I'm paraphrasing here, Alex, but essentially, your thoughts on like generalist versus focused uh, kind of approaches, uh, as far as the uh, in, uh, you know managers that you're investing in, and how do you think about this from your own portfolio construction, right? Like, you know, do you sort of try to balance them out and stuff like that? I, I would say that at this stage when we are investing mostly or almost entirely on emerging managers or even first-time managers and, and solo GPs. In, in that space, um, I, I prefer specialist for, for certain, many reasons. One of them is, is, is the deal flow and the understanding. And in particular, if you can find these people who have been doing something as founders or, or operators or or you know, past experience that they they know exactly what they are doing there. Then then it's a specialist. But in some cases, um, and in this case, it would mean that if if I find a good generalist, it would be a person who does have track record. He has done it already. He he can show me that uh, as a generalist, he has been able to generate nice multiples because sometimes these generalists they have not good networks and they're very good with people because they can get themselves into th certain deals you know which means that there is this uh, small part of a hustler there maybe even so they can talk themselves into the deals and they are likable people and stuff like that and they, you know they they want to have these investors around even though they might not be specialists so there they could be both but uh, uh, you know specialists normally are former founders or people who know the, the trade extremely well and uh, you know are active in networks and uh, are expected to understand what they are doing uh, yes, it was asking about pitfalls and red flags that that 
you know, ones that you see during due diligence and how should uh, LPs first aware be aware of and manage them? Any any kind of examples you can give here would be useful. Yeah, the, there was this one thing when I was talking about intuition. This happened to me around maybe 1997 or 1998. Uh, this a colleague of mine who was a little bit older than I was, he, he told me that... Uh, in a due diligence process that if there is something that bothers you and you can't really tell yourself what it is, you know, you should trust that intuition. And I really didn't understand what he was talking about. But 10 years after I understood that once you get that, you know, certain type of intuition or gut feeling, you can get certain type of information about the um these these it's not it's mostly about these people how they are doing it um it's about that part of the due diligence trust the intuition uh, but that that is a little bit difficult because if sometimes it takes some time to get one you know intuition and um, if you don't have it you can't use it uh and that's a little bit difficult uh the other thing is that one of the reasons I take my time, uh, my due diligence on, on fund level takes, you know, at least several weeks and sometimes it might take months. And when I was running that uh, institutional LP thing, it, it could take six months or so. But the thing is that I want to ask the same types of questions about certain things and, and make sure that I got these answers, which are, they don't have to be identical, mm -hmm. but they, they, they should follow a certain, you know, a path maybe. Uh, and if you get that type of information that changes a lot, it's a, it's a red flag. And then I, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, I don't like people who, who lie to me. <laughs> I, I'm, I really can't take that. I can't take that stuff, you know. But if you've been in the business, you know, like direct investments, the, the thing is that it, that happens there. And sometimes the, the even the GPs do it when they're raising funds. They might not want to do it. And sometimes they even don't know that they are doing it. But th that is always a red flag if you get that type of information uh, what what I did in the past, and and I might do this even in the future. Sometimes, if I ask a tough question, I might get an answer which is not accurate. Then I ask the question again during the meeting, and if I still get the same answer, I won't do anything. Uh, if I have the next meeting, you know, within like two or four weeks' time. I might still ask the question, and if I still get the same answer, then it's a red flag. Because sometimes people say things they really don't mean, because they are stressed and they try to make a good impression and, you know, make the fun, see, fun look like as, you know, even better than it is, you know. But that is a red flag. You should be able to trust the information you get. Um, you know, question here from Brian on kind of follow-ons, you know, do the the funds reserve uh, typically follow-on investments in your experience? And I'm assuming he's referring to like new and emerging managers they, uh, or, and, or if not, do they just handle the follow-ons through like an SPV or something? Both, both. It really depends. And both are acceptable and they, uh, uh, they, they should have that on their, on their pitch deck and, and thesis, which one is the 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 strategy they prefer mm. but i've seen both and both are fine uh, and if we know that before we make the investment decision we just they they shouldn't change that after we made the decision so um scott is a with some context here, he's a former SaaS entrepreneur, and I'm paraphrasing here, Scott, because it's a pretty big question. Um, and he's been basically been asked by a, a micro fund to, uh, you know, invest, uh, you know, uh, in their fund. 
uh, he likes the space, he says, but they're, the, the team is a little bit on proven uh, and haven't done a lot of investments. Um, what are some top things that he should look at during diligence? Um, you know, and any sort of uh, levers, and I'd love to get your views on this, to negotiate better terms as an LP with the fund. Yes, um, this is a very difficult question because I don't know who they are. <clears throat> you know, that it's a difficult question to answer and it's um, uh, dif difficult to say any, to give any recommendations uh, how to do it. But my, my first recommendation is that uh, regardless of what type of investor you are, if you're a private person or, you know, high net worth individual or, or private, private investor, you should do at least some type of due diligence. Because what I've seen a lot is that people don't do it. And it is, I mean, it's weird because if, it, would you give some money to a stranger if he just asked it? It's it's like your duty because even if you're investing your own money, but, you know, try to um, conduct a certain, at least a uh, uh, certain due diligence on them. But uh, if, if it's a micro fund, and I assume that it's the first time fund there, without any track record? Uh, do they have any angel track record? Uh, do they have experience from that particular field they were investing in and, and stuff like that? And I would recommend to talk with them uh, and also make some reference checks if they give you the opportunity to make that. Sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes it's it's it cannot be done, but at least with us, uh, uh, we require that. And maybe you know somebody who has invested in that fund. You know, it's it's a difficult question. What about the second part of the questions about uh, trying to negotiate better terms as an LP? I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I've got a lot of thoughts on this too. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, thing is that you are there in order to make money, not save money by getting lower fees. I mean, it's the, you should invest in them and pay what they want to. If you think that they are able to create the multiple you're expecting, because the better terms uh, normally don't compensate that, uh, the fact that if they're not good investors, I mean, you might save a bit with management fee or, or carry, but it really doesn't mean that the overall return would be much better. So basically, even what I did, even when we wrote pretty substantial checks, I was not the guy who was trying to get the better terms or you know lower fees because I wanted to invest in the managers that are creating net multiples that were good enough for us. It can, you know, change your thinking because this is not a business where we try to get the rebates. We try to get the returns. Yeah, and and the the returns are so asymptotic, like just they're so wild, right? Like if you get it right, you, you know, this isn't like like the difference between like the best performing manager on in the public markets. And like an average one, it goes from like a one to like a 1.6 or something, right? Yeah. In venture, the difference between an okay manager in in a new manager and a great manager is, could be 100x, yeah, right? right? And so you're sort of optimizing for the wrong thing on that. The second thing is, is that remember how we started this conversation talking about how it's important for the fund to, to fundraise, get to the next fund, raise that fund, raise that fund. And, if you ask for special terms, this is basically sort of done through side letters, which the SEC has come down on really hard, yeah. right? The manager now has to disclose whatever terms you ask to everybody else. And if you're a small time investor, that's bad, right? Because now they have to basically give it to everybody, right? Yeah. And so you're actually hurting their ability to fundraise because of these sort of special terms. And so I wouldn't, so you got to be very careful with that kind of, those kinds of requests in general, with, if you want them to perform and give yeah. you that 100X or whatever potential they can yeah. give you. And it's a potential bad sign if they would say yes. That's true. Because, they, because then you would ask the question why. Yeah. 
There's a there's another question here, um, and maybe we kind of weren't very clear about this, so maybe we can sort of clarify. Is there's why is there such impetus impetus put on the manager being needed needing to be able to raise like subsequent funds when you're sort of doing like the diligence process and things like that? Well, for, for myself, the fact is that I've I've seen this in the past, but let's let's put it this way: the manager raises the first fund. And he does have or she has an investment period from two to four years. And then they should manage the fund for the uh, next 10 to 15 years. And if they are not able to raise the second fund, they don't have the economics or incentives to manage the rest, the, the first fund for the next coming 10 to 15 years, even if they wanted to. They, they kind of have to be able to make a living. And for me, as an LP, it's a nightmare if I get a fund that nobody's managing it, really. Because yeah, it's because not only... You have to do a lot of work to get those exits in year 10, in year 12. A, absolutely. Plus, we, we should get the reports and everything, the, the filings and whatever you have there. You know, it's a, it's a long-term commitment. You know, you have to understand that. It's 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 even longer for the LP than it's for the GP, you know, because normally GP uh, invests in a company wants to get rid of that within four to six years. But if you have a portfolio of 30 companies, it's it's certain that some of these companies are going to be there uh, year 10 or 15. And then uh, we should get the reports and they should try to get rid of them the tail end and sell them. So it's extremely important to understand that. I uh, I think that we had, when I quit, uh, it was 20, it was last year, 2023. And I think that we had one particular investment, fund investment in our portfolio and the vintage was 1997, which is almost impossible. That's you know. great. It's impossible. But what happens quite regularly is that regardless if you have those 10 plus two year, you know, term sheets, it happens that you still might have uh, some some part of the tail end there uh, after 15 years. And and then the LPs have to negotiate and at that so, so that somebody's going to take care of that tail end. Uh, of the portfolio, you know, they still have to make the exits so that they can close the fund because you don't want to get in-kind distributions. You don't want to get, you know, shares of some you know, company, you, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a good thing. Uh, Dimitri is asking, you know, uh, how do you verify, you know, someone's information, like such as their experience and the data being provided, you know, People put charts and stuff into their decks, past performance, but how do you actually verify that it's correct? Uh, the past performance, you know, uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, it could be difficult if you have invested in you know, like Angel 200 cases. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is that I can, um, you know, the thing is that LPs know other people and LPs, and they can make some calls. And if I find anything there at all which is not correct it's a deal breaker so the person takes a huge risk by putting there something that is not accurate totally. but what, the, the other thing is that we kind of know that uh you can't rely 100 percent on that track record and sometimes if it's too good then it's too good you know the other thing is that for example I might want to discuss about certain deal that might be in the, in the in the pitch deck, and I might have been involved in that deal, or I might know some people, maybe the founder of the company or somebody else from that particular deal, and and you know it's a big risk to put something into there which is not true, because yeah. this is about two things: trust and reputation. If you lose your reputation during the fundraising, for example, of your first or second fund, it's difficult to restore. 
and and the you know the NPs they actually talk with each other. Yeah, you can't get that back once you've once. No, you get then it, when it's gone, it's gone, baby. Yeah, it's not gone. coming back. <laughs> so you know, we spend uh, all this time sort of talking about diligence and all the stuff we sort of should watch out for, educating the audience on things to sort of watch out for. Um, I, I really actually really like this question from Priya. You know, what switching what attracts you to sort of invest in uh, in in a fund, right? What are some of the things you you want to see or kind of you know, is it IRR? Is it the people, curiosity? Yeah, the thing is that, you know, we, we have, at this st stage of, uh, of my career, I'm investing in mostly in emerging managers and first-time managers. And it's totally different to invest in established managers where you have these IRRs and TVPIs and whatever you have there. And uh, you might have invested in, in the past five funds of theirs, you know, so it's, it's part of the portfolio then. But what excites me about being able to be uh, investing in these first-time managers or the, or the emerging managers is that my, my personal ambition would be one of the first, if not the first, institutional investor in one of those future Hall of Famers. Because, you know, it's tough and it's difficult and it's hard to identify those. But uh, the, uh, the thing is that um, I'm really convinced that uh, uh, these uh, the, these funds are the, the ones that are able to make the best returns, the best multiples. And it doesn't really give me any satisfaction anymore to be able to invest funds where I know that they are going to generate something like 2x. I give you an example. Uh, when we invested in uh, and, and, uh, in private debt and private credit funds, we knew that uh, it's going to be anything between 1.3 and 1.5, and the best ones are going to make 1.6 or maybe 1.7. That's how it is, you know. Then you go to established LBO, PE funds. It's like from 1.8 to maybe 2x. And established venture capital managers, once you've been investing in their funds, you know that it's going to be around 2.2, 2.4. And the volume of funds is a little bit lower. Once we get into this space, we know that the best ones can make you 10x. Uh, the expectations are higher than for established managers, but it is difficult to choose the right ones. The fund selection makes it makes it exciting you know when you uh, we, we, you have to work harder this is not easy you know but it shouldn't be so it gives me satisfaction because once in a while I can see that when I meet these managers or when I talk with them that these people are really good at it I, I get that feeling that they are going to make it and it gives me a great satisfaction to understand that uh, if if what, I would be one of the first one, first ones to uh, to back them, you know, on, on their journey to become a venture capitalist, I want to be in that part of the business nowadays, or after all these years. And 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 you know, just the missions, right, of some of these of some of these folks is just so profound and inspiring, right? It's yeah. just it's really cool to see just the impact they're going to have on the future of whatever yeah. their thesis is as well. So that's also plays a huge role, at least for me, you know. Yeah, that is, that's, that's true. You know, that's, that's absolutely so. Uh, and, and I think that the changes that need to be made on, on venture capital and private equity are, are probably going to happen from the, from the new generation of managers. Right. I, I think for the positive, I think that's, that's how it is, you know. It there was beautiful. This was beautiful business for for you know, like 20, 30 years ago, but it got, kind of got out of whack a bit, you know. Yeah, but, agree. Uh, yeah, that's how it is. Um, everyone, um, just if you join late, just as FYI, we're closing admissions to the LP Institute. Um, you know on on Sunday, I believe it is. Yes, it's on Sunday. So if you're considering uh, becoming a limited partner or 
wanting to learn more about how to be a limited partner in uh, new and emerging managers in particular. We actually have a program specifically for this. Marco is one of the mentors as well. So you just make sure that you uh, that you apply for that uh, moving forward. You know, we have roughly about three minutes left, Marco. I'd love to kind of just end with some sort of parting words of advice for the next generation of limited partners that are going to be stewards of these like new and emerging managers. Um, any sort of thoughts and any sort of like kind of like advice that you'd like to kind of leave uh, the folks that are on this webinar that are considering becoming limited partners or are limited partners? Yeah, the first thing is that you need to make a decision if you want to become one. Sure. And then you need to know why you want to do it. And after you know why you want to do it, you should be able to understand how you're going to do it. And after you know how you're going to do it, you have to decide what you are going to do it. It, it goes like that, you know. Uh, but I would say that uh, uh, the, if, one of those things is that uh, try to be curious about things uh, and try to uh, base at the same time you should be a little bit skeptical maybe don't don't believe everything uh, try to understand what is your own way of doing it uh, the other thing is that if you're very new to this asset class and if you haven't done it in the past don't try to figure that out on your own because uh, you can find people, you can create networks of people who are willing to do it, who have done it maybe in the past. It's it's all about community of being, you know, LPs. Uh, and if, if you get into that LP community, it's a nice place to be, you know. I agree. I agree 100%. And that's why we're trying to do these things. And that's why we do these webinars so that we can sort of foster more and more of this uh, knowledge so that people can go ahead and uh, communicate with each other and learn more. Marco, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this. Every single time we do a webinar together, I feel like I learn a ton. Really I, appreciate it. Mike, this is get crazier and crazier every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I agree. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Really appreciate bye -bye. it. Bye, everyone. Hopefully bye. this is helpful. Bye. bye.